Hey guys, welcome to Bethel Online. My name is Jason, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad you decided to make us a part of your weekend. No matter who you are, where you come from, we're so glad you're here. Our vision is to be a safe place for real people to encounter the real Jesus and experience real change. Our hope and our prayer is that no matter who you are or what you've been through, you know that you are loved and you are wanted here. We would love to get to know you better and help you connect with all that's going on. You can do this by going to our website at www.bethel.us or by downloading the Bethel app. You can find our app by searching Bethel Putco in your app store. Both online and in the app, you can fill out digital connection card. It only takes a minute and it'll help us know how to serve you better. Another way you can connect today is through giving. Your generosity at Bethel directly impacts God's mission to radically change people's lives in Putnam County and beyond. Through the ministries of Bethel and the many local and regional organizations we support, people are able to see the grace of God and how much He loves them. You can always give on our website at Bethel.us forward slash give or in the Bethel app. Thank you for partnering with us and making a difference. Well, thanks again for tuning in online today. Know that you are wanted and welcome here, and you are loved. I hope you all have a great day. Good morning, and welcome to Bethel. We're so glad that you chose to join us. Whatever your history, whatever your circumstances, wherever you come from, we're just glad that you took a minute to join us this morning because we believe when real people like you and I encounter Jesus, it changes absolutely everything. We're beginning a series today called Struggle Bus. It's the first of a seven-week series. When I was growing up, I believed that to follow Jesus was to live life in a way that you didn't struggle. I don't think anyone taught me that. I just think it's what I concocted in my head, that somehow, if I had faith, if I had Jesus, that I wouldn't have any questions and that the struggles would kind of go away. This morning, as I dropped off my sons at the junior high school, I passed a friend in the drop-off line, and I said, Hey, how are you doing this morning? And she just looked up and said, We're on the struggle bus this morning. Now, I guess I could have judged that comment because, honestly, I had had a pretty decent morning. But the minute that she said that, I understood. You know why? Because I've been on the struggle bus. That despite following Jesus for the last 20 years of my life, I'll just be up front and tell you sometimes I struggle. Sometimes I struggle with questions. I really believe when we are following Jesus, we don't necessarily get to live a life without questions that we struggle with. As a matter of fact, sometimes while we're following Jesus, we have to ride the struggle bus. We have to ride along in the middle of our struggle while we follow Jesus. Maybe for you, there was a time in life when that thing happened, that thing that caused you to struggle, that event or that tragedy or that hurt or that pain and while you might have been trying to follow Jesus, you might have tried to pretend you understood why it happened, but you didn't. And maybe maybe you weren't following Jesus. And honestly, maybe one of the reasons you aren't following Jesus is that you had this question that you didn't feel like you could ask is, why did God let it happen? Why is there suffering and pain in this life? Here's the good news. When it comes to the question of suffering and pain, you aren't alone. First off, you're not alone in the fact that everyone as a part of this life experiences suffering and pain. And you're also not alone because there's a God who will walk with you in it. You're not alone because if you look biblically, you can see stories of people like the prophet Jeremiah who just could not understand the pain of other people not getting the message God was giving him to share with them. Jeremiah was known as the weeping, 
prophet because there were times in which he just literally seems heartbroken and unable to understand why, despite all that he was going through, people weren't understanding. There's King David, the man known as the greatest king in Israel's history, who was also known as the man after God's own heart. And even David sometimes went through spans that you can read in the Psalms and you can see that David is wrestling with, where is God in my suffering? John the Baptist was likely within his mother's womb when he first recognized the Messiah. He was the one who baptized Jesus, the Son of God, who recognized that God's blessing was upon this Jesus who was his son and who proclaimed it to many, many people. But John the Baptist later in life experienced time in prison where he was actually going to eventually get his get beheaded and killed. And John the Baptist even says at one point during scripture, like, is this really Jesus? Like the suffering was so intense that he questioned. And I would not say today that Jeremiah and David and John the Baptist lacked faith. I, I would actually say they were living out faith in the midst of suffering that exists. There's a lesser known character in scripture though, and his name is Asaph. And we're going to talk a little bit today about Asaph. A Asaph was a prophet during the time of King David. As a matter of fact, there are 12 Psalms attributed to him. He was kind of the worship leader of the tabernacle during the day. I mean, he was the skinny jean wearing, uh, guitar toting, worship God loudly guy. And we see in the Psalm that one of his Psalms, one of his, his actual written songs to worship God shows his own questioning of God. And if you've ever gone through suffering, then you've asked questions like Epicurus did 300 years before the birth of Jesus. Now, Epicurus is not a man of faith. He's just merely a man asking questions near Rome. He's, he's asking questions like, if there is a God, if God is not able to prevent evil, then maybe he's not all powerful. And while you and I nearly gasp as religious people in the 20th century at this question of God, maybe Epicurus was wrestling with the question that we all do, that if there is a God and he's good, can't he prevent evil? If there's a God and he's over all things, can he not fix evil? But see, God wasn't after a creation of people who were just a rock or a being. God was after a relationship with his creation. And if pain is not an option, pain and suffering is not an option, neither is faith or love. We don't want to live in a loveless world, but God wasn't just concerned about loving us. He wanted the return of the love of his people. Could he have created something that would have spent its entire history praising him and telling him how great he was? Yes, but God desired the returned love of his people. He loved his creation, said it was good, but wanted the love of that creation in return. If he's not willing to prevent evil, have you ever wrestled with this? If God's not willing to prevent evil, then he's not all good. Have you ever wrestled with the goodness of God? And I'll just tell you now that after 20 years of wrestling, I'm more and more convinced all the time that God is good. But I'm also convinced that if you really seek God, follow him, you will experience times in your life that are not good. And that despite the circumstances of your life, he really is good. But I didn't get there in one day. I got there through some times of suffering, some times where I didn't understand, some times where I just asked the questions. Sometimes I actually just held the questions deep in my soul. Times in which I said, God, if you're there, why don't you stop this garbage? Epicurus wondered this question, and, and he even said, it, if God is not willing to prevent all evil, then he's not all good. He said, if God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil still exist? 
Many people have used the presence of evil as their explanation for why they don't believe there's a God, but actually, God is the one who sets the standard of what's good and evil. Uh, Let me explain this to you. I, I have three kids, and every now and then, one of them will feel wronged, and the other one will feel wronged, and they will run to me. Like, who gets to sit next to mom right now? That's that's the pressing question in my house some days. It's like my wife is like the superstar parent and and the kids always want to be right next to her so much that sometimes I'm like, hey, you guys move. I was here first. But my kids will come to me and dad, I was there. Noah snuck in while I got up to go brush my teeth because you made me brush my teeth. Shouldn't I get to sit next to mom? And, and they're asking all of these questions trying to, and they come to me and One of them has a valid argument for, this is so painful, I don't get to sit next to mom right now. And the other is coming to me like, this is why it's right and just that I get to sit next to mom right now. And usually that's just where I step in and say, hey, she was my girl first, I'm sitting here. But the reality is, the reason that they come to me, the reason that they come to her, the reason that they, they come both feeling the injustice of the moment that there aren't enough sides to mom for three kids to sit next to her is that they know there has to be a standard of what is right or wrong. And the same is true for you and I. The reason we feel this need to understand what is unjust is that someone sets the standard for what is just. And that person is God. The scripture tells us that no one of us is right on our own. But how do we know? There are just things in this world that you know are wrong and things in this world that you know are right. How is that? It's the imprint of God on your heart. The reason you have questions in the midst of suffering is that you recognize that there are things here broken. If God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil even exist? It exists because God set a standard of good and evil, wrong and right. And when God did that, it gave humanity, people like you and me, you know, those real people we talk about in our church vision, the ability to choose how they would react in relation to God. And sometimes, if we're honest, even when it feels like life is in the wrong to us, we have been wrong. And God so loved us to send his son to die on the cross to pay a price to reunite our relationship with him, to to reconnect us with him. He would send his son to die on the cross, raised from the dead, to pay a price that was ours to pay in order to overcome that which is in us that distances us from him. And so when we wrestle, by all means, don't hear me today judging you for wrestling with the questions of your heart. As a matter of fact, let the questions of your heart guide you to the one who sets the standards, who was, is, and will always be righteous, but also in the midst of his righteousness is a God who is good. Good is God, and God is good. Goodness is defined by the character of God, not by the standard of men. And God's standard is far different than that of humanity. He has high standards and you and I on our own and without Jesus cannot live to those standards. And because of that, we often experience pain in our own personal life and we often cause pain upon others in life. And therefore pain exists in this world while there is a good God. Today, I want to challenge you with this idea that Christianity makes sense of, gives meaning to, and offers a solution for the evil and suffering we experience. Now, let me separate this a little bit because I use the word Christianity and that can be such a loaded word in our culture. We've experienced Christians. And let me change that word Christianity to discipleship. You see, Christianity is often defined by what allegiance you claim to God. But Jesus wasn't just after a one moment claimed allegiance to him. Jesus was after a personal relationship with. And a personal relationship with him in which we follow him, 
will help us make sense of, give meaning to, and offer a solution for the evil and suffering we experienced. Isn't it funny when we experience pain that those are the moments where we're tempted to walk away from God because we question His goodness, because while He might be good, we aren't feeling good? I believe discipleship, following Jesus. Jesus said it this way. He, he looked at the people around him often in Scripture and said, come and follow me. Now, if you follow somebody for a moment on a journey, you will get lost. When you stop following, you will get lost and confused. Many of us, when we experience pain, just our lack of understanding makes us assume things about God that aren't true and makes us maybe not follow him. And so we find ourselves once again kind of confused and lost when we experience pain. And if you've ever been there, like pain can be disorienting. Suffering can, can really help us make us lose track of where we're going. And it can be a temptation of us to take our eyes off of God when we question God's goodness. And if you're here today and you're questioning God's goodness, or you're here today and you are really wrestling with this message because you're ready to fight God over things that have happened in your life, look, I understand. And I think people like Jeremiah, David, John the Baptist, and even Asaph the prophet would have understood this angst that you're feeling. The reality is, though, God's goodness has not been altered by your experience. In Psalm 73, verses 11 through 14, you know, Asaph, the worship leader of the tabernacle during the days of David, he says, what does God know? He says, what does God know, they ask? D does the Most High even know what's happening? If you've ever been in pain or agony or unjust su suffering, You've asked this question like, God, do you see me down here? I mean, Asaph had to have been like, God, you know, I worship you every day in the tabernacle. Like, how can it be this way that it feels like you're not here in the midst of my pain? Where are you? Why did you let this happen? He said, look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? He said, did, did I try to do what was right? only to feel pain? Well, no one else seems to hear the message that I'm saying. Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? Like, did I do the right thing and now all of these people are benefiting and I'm over here suffering because they don't get it? Asaph is wrestling with the goodness of God in his circumstances. It wasn't that he didn't love God. It wasn't that he hadn't heard of God. It was that there were things he still had to learn about God. And because of that, he's asking the questions, I believe, that one of the great steps of faith in the human life is to ask questions. Why do my kids approach me about things that are unjust? Because they believe I have answers about them. Why can we approach God? Because he's a better father than anyone we could know. And he's a good one. And our questions are not a pain in the neck to him. They're actually dear to his heart. Asaph said, I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. So if God is loving, why would he allow suffering? You know, suffering and pain aren't necessarily separate from love. I learned this years ago, having back problems, um, going to the chiropractor, <laughs> like the chiropractor wanted to give me relief, but oftentimes the binds and the positions that the chiropractor would put me in would create pain. Many of you have had surgeries and you know that the surgeon's end goal was to see you experience a less painful life, a less problematic life, a more healthy life, but somewhere in the middle, the, the surgeon had to cut you. It had to impact what was wounded in you. God so desires a relationship with you that sometimes he will allow suffering for the sake of showing you his goodness. A year ago, 
our whole church was wrestling with the illness of our worship pastor, Aaron. God, what's the purpose? We love Aaron. He's a great guy. We love being around him. He's like a brother to the people around him. We love him. Like, God, he worships you with all of his heart. He's raising his children to follow you with all of his heart. He's loving his wife. Like, God, why would you allow this suffering, a simple surgery, to become chaotic? And I'd like to tell you that in the moment, I was like, oh, God is good. But the reality is in those days following pain and suffering, sometimes it's hard to see the goodness of God. Our inability to see the goodness of God does not mean God is not good. We can see a lot of things that came out of those days, but I also still believe there are good things left to come out of it. Maybe you grew up in a home where your suffering impacted you greatly. You know, like, God, I, there I was. God, I did nothing. I was innocent. I didn't deserve it. It wasn't my fault. And you allowed it to happen to me. Are you even good? God, are you even God? And God, if you are even there, then I got something to say to you. God, if you're loving, why would you allow the suffering? And maybe you've asked the question, if love is a choice, is suffering a possibility because God loved us and desired our love in return, he gave us a choice, our free will. Would we love him back? You know, you have the choice as to whether you will love other people and you have the choice as to whether you would love God. God could have made you so that you would automatically just sit around and be like, God is great. God is good. God is amazing. But love, love is a choice. Love says that even in the middle of what I don't understand, I can choose to love you back. You see, God chose to love us. Scripture tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not die, but have everlasting life. When it came to you, when it came to his son's own suffering, when it came to Jesus's own suffering, he was willing to choose to love you by sacrificing and experiencing pain and suffering. He's not a God who doesn't understand suffering. He is often a God who walks with us in the midst of our suffering. So we ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? I understand this question. I've asked it over the years. I've stood in tragedies with countless people who have experienced things that didn't make sense. I literally can remember carrying a mother who had just lost her teenage son into her home over my shoulder as she was beating my back and screaming, why, why, why? I remember wishing I had something to say. I remember wanting to help her tie up her pain in a real nice, neat little bow and end the pain. The truth was I didn't know the answer to her pain. Maybe you live life and you experience the constant pain of loneliness. And maybe you live life with a tragedy that you don't understand or an addiction you can't deal with. And you've tried to do your best and here you are with the same pain over and over and over again. Why? And you ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, Jesus asked this question in Matthew 27, verse 46. Jesus has walked in close, tight relationship with God. He's followed the laws of his father. He's been obedient to what he was to be obedient for. He's loved the people that God sent him to love. 
And now because he's loved them, he is going to the cross where he's going to die. He's actually on the cross where he's going to literally die because of the brokenness of all the people around him. And he experiences the pain of feeling like God's not there. You see, our sin, our choice when we choose, when, when, when the presence of sin in the world where others can choose creates pain. Pain so much that even Jesus would ask the question about the distance he was feeling between himself and the Father in this moment of his pain. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, as a pastor and a preacher, I can take you into places and remind you of pain and hurt and maybe even bring up some old stirring wounds and questions you have. And it really serves no purpose to just bring up those pains just for the sake of feeling emotion and getting emotional. But I really believe that discipleship and following Jesus can help us find purpose and meaning and understanding in the suffering that we feel. So I'm coming to you today not just with the bad news that suffering is a reality. You already knew that. Not just with the bad news that suffering and pain can cause questions, but with some good news. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we're giving in probably the most concise way good news. That this God who has standards, this God who judges right from wrong, this God who is over all things, above all things, in all of his goodness, despite our ability to choose what is wrong, he so loved us. The passage says, God so loved the world. But he so loved you. In that moment of suffering in the middle of your pain and disorientation, God loved you. So much that he gave his one and only son. He gave what was most precious to him, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Is it because we deserved it or because we were good? Friend, the only time that anything bad really happened to a good person, it was this Jesus. You see, he was good and he was right and he did add up to the standard of the Father. And all of the evil, the choices of you and I to not love God, to not follow obediently, led that he would have to die to reestablish a relationship between what God loved and God. And Jesus paid the price, the scripture says, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that's a truth, a reality, a, a fact of God's word is that there will be an eternal life. And that eternal life, as Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 says, he'll wipe out every tear from their eyes and there will be no more, no more death, no more sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. It describes eternity with God. But I don't know about you. I'm still not experiencing that yet. I still have pain. I still see suffering. There are people in Europe right now who are experiencing the pain of the evil of another man who is trying to overtake their country. They didn't ask for it. They didn't want it. Even the people of Russia don't desire this war. And yet they're experiencing suffering because... People have the choice. So what do we do as a people who know one day he'll wipe all the tear for, tears from our eyes? One day there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. And he'll be gone forever. But we live in the right now in the not quite there yet. What do we do with it as a people who because of God's love have been given the, the, the future and a promise of what God is yet to, to bring about. And yet we live in the right now, in the not there yet. 
Asaph wrestles with God in the beginning, and later we see a psalm where he says, when I tried to understand it, it troubled me deeply. As a pastor, when I see the pain of the people that I love, it often troubles me deeply. It makes me ask God these questions. Why, God? Where are you? What are you doing? God, why won't you wrap this up in a neat bow? It's not just that God wants to one day give us a place with no more pain and hurt. I believe it's that God along the way wants to show us who he is as we hurt. That there are things we learn in the pain about God that allow us to say 20 years later, I believe God is good while the things around me are not yet. He said, when I tried to understand this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. My flesh and heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Asaph realized that this life is temporary. It's not eternal. This is the right now, not the not there yet. And he's recognizing that, you know, my heart and my flesh may fail. This body, your body, my body, our, our heart, one of us, all of us, at some point our heart will beat its last beat and our lungs will breathe in its last breath. And in the meantime, we can enter into the sanctuary of God to gather, enter into that deeper relationship with God. You see, sometimes pain tries to lie to us and tell us that the answer is to distance ourselves from God, but it's actually exactly when we should lean in to God. My flesh and heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It always strikes me as I'm preparing these messages, as I'm delivering these messages, whether in a room or literally right now, I'm in an old garage and we'll put up a cool background in a little bit and make it look like a real room and um, whatever's cool or hip, we'll put back there or we'll at least try. But the reality is for many of us, Right now, we're in the middle of the struggle bus. The good news is not that God loves us when the struggle bus is gone. It's that he loves us while we're on the bus. That he loves us while we're in the middle of the struggle. That he loved us before, he loves us now, and he'll always love us. And it's his love that gives us the power and the strength and the ability to take a step forward. Maybe you're asking, God, why did you let it happen? And I would love to tell you that I understand the meaning of that horrible day in your life. That I totally know why God ultimately let happen what happened to you. And um, I can't. But I can tell you that he breathes purpose out of pain. That he loved you before, he loves you now, and he'll love you forever. And that rather than distancing ourselves because we feel pain, rather than pushing God away because we don't understand why it happened, that maybe understanding can be found in him. I don't know what it's like to watch from your living room on a Sunday morning. And, you know, maybe you're looking at your watch thinking, you know, I got to start lunch here in a minute. And I've kind of watched church or maybe, maybe you'll show up in person on Sunday and you're going to, you're going to watch the sermon and then go out to lunch with your family and not think about it much. But maybe you've been throwing away the pain that you've gone through and you're like, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to talk about that. I, I just don't know that God can handle it. But maybe today your step is to ask God about that. Maybe in the middle of your question, that's a fair question, God, why did you let it happen? Maybe rather than assuming there's something bad about God that made it happen, you begin to ask the question within the light of, God, if you're a good God, what can you redeem out of what happened to me? You see, 2,000 years ago, 
the evil of men led the Son of God to a cross where he was innocent and yet he was murdered. Seemed hopeless and helpless and yet three days later when they went to find him, he had risen from the dead and given hope to people like you and me who would also experience suffering. It might just be that God wants to redeem your pain. But God is a loving God and he doesn't force us to give him our struggles and give him our pain. Today you can choose to give him entry back into your heart to say, God, would you help me understand why it happened? God, can you bring good about what I could not possibly imagine ever having good. God, can you take the ugly moment on the struggle bus and turn it into forward progress? Maybe you should take a moment this morning and just pray to God about the thing you haven't talked to him about in a while. Maybe you should pray about the thing that makes your chest feel tight and your throat feel closed up. Maybe this is the morning where you say to God, hey, look, if you're good, God, can you help me? Because he was good, is good, and he will always be good. And he will help those who call out to him. The scripture says, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. Will you draw near to God? I love you, Bethel, and have a great week. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment, if you haven't already, to go to your app store and search Bethel Hutco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages. You can view the messages from Sunday morning. And you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved.